fun. We went to a soccer game last night. Um, first ever time going to Austin FC. It was fun. Had a lot, a lot of fun. Um, we lost one to zero. That's right. One to zero. Lots of scoring. Lots of scoring. Um, here's what's fascinating, though. It, who's been to an Austin FC game? Okay, five of us. Sweet. Who's been to a professional soccer game before? Does that increase? Okay, doubles to 10. Sweet. Right on. Not the biggest sport in America, obviously. But here's the deal. 90 minutes. And if you want to add in the five additional stop, you know, bo- like stop time, stoppage time, 95 minutes. The East side of the stadium sang and chanted for 95 minutes. You ask Corey, was there like background, like stadium music? No, they were the music. They were the music. They had drums and trombones. And this one guy on top of his, uh, his drum that you hit like that, the bass drum, big drum, you hold it, anyways. He had a, a cymbal with a little cymbal and he was just like clanging that cymbal. And I mean, 90 minutes. And here's what I thought. Here's what I thought to myself, y'all. We don't struggle to worship. It's just a matter of what we are going to worship, right? Like we, we are people who worship. It's just natural in us that we are going to celebrate and exalt and lift up something. And man, it's great. Go worship. Like go, that sounds awful, right? Go and, and do your singing for 90 minutes. But I, I think it's funny then that we like, we don't know how to handle this for 20 minutes. We're like, oh my gosh, they just sang the same thing. They just sang the same chorus twice, right? And man, they sang the same line, I don't know how many times, like 40. It was just over and over and over and over again. It just tells me like, man, we don't really have a problem with worshiping. In the church, we just don't necessarily want to worship God. Let's be honest, right? Like it's just not the thing that we're most excited about. So that was just a little side note. That's what, that's what kept us up late, but um, that was, that's not in the sermon here. Um, sorry for that. I'm a little thrown off because I don't even know where my, there we go. Yo, I'm excited for the series. Um, it, it's something that God's been putting in my heart for a while. And, and here's the deal. You know, I think if you're like me, then church can become very familiar. You can get really used to the routine and the same thing um, over and over and over and over and over again. Because let's be honest, we got the same book, right? We, we sing the same songs because it's been the same for 2,000 years. So it's not like we're coming up with new material. Um, and, and so it can become very familiar Um, But here's the deal. God is living and active today. And he is here among us and he wants to speak to us today. He wants to speak to you. And so let's just, let's be ready and let's be willing and let's expect that God is going to speak to you, right? If I sit down with Michaela, um, this is gonna be a bad example. So we're not driving home after school. It's a different time um, because after school you get nothing from her, right? If I sit down with her and I ask her a question, I'm going to expect a response, right? Y'all probably do the same in conversation, right? You expect there's going to be a response, and yet we don't expect that from God, right? Like we, we sit down and we pray or we read or we come to worship, but we don't expect that God's going to speak to us. And here's the deal. He wants to speak to us just as much as the person next to us does. Like he's actually going every, every single conversation. We can hear from God. Isn't that That's wild to me because it, it should be so basic, and yet it's not. And so I'm excited for this series because it, it, man, it's just getting down into the foundations of things, the, the, the basics of things, so that we can know and live in God more than we've ever imagined. He has more for you in a relationship with him than our brains can literally comprehend right now. And so when we talk, don't, I know some of this may be like, oh man, I've heard this before. Again, it's the same material, right? Always going to be the same. But let's not let the familiarity of it like just kind of dull our hearing to to hearing what God wants for us, okay? So let's go into it with that mindset. Um, I I wanna bring on stage here, um, this is a a tree. Um, If you're like, nice plant. Um, No, it's a tree, it's just a, she's a baby tree. She's a baby tree, she's an orange tree. Um, Her name is Susie. Um, And so Susie here is, is an orange tree. Now, I'm going to ask you a question, and this is where you get to, to help, me, help me preach a little bit. Did you, did you know? Let me just, because I don't think I knew this, but let me just go ahead and let you know for myself, but then also for, for Mike or Stephen or whoever else preaches or, or whoever else is leading, did you know that, that your participation actually helps me preach? Right? It, this, 
this is hard. Like, this is tough. The public speaking thing, I think it's the most common fear, right? It, this, is, this is tough, right? And so feedback, input, like active listening, um, you know, some response, a little bit of like, yep, amen, come on. That, that helps me. So I'm just going to ask you to go ahead and join me in things because it's actually helpful to, to me and to others. You don't have to get all crazy, but just maybe a little bit like, yep, let's go. Um, that's great. I love that. I appreciate that. So um, what, this is an orange tree. What would you say her primary purpose is in life? Did you read my notes? Did you really? Oh, with the iPad, that was you, that was you. You're reading my notes. It literally says produce oranges. Like that's the next two words, is to produce oranges. Her purpose is to produce oranges because why? She's an orange tree. I told Mike I had an orange tree. He was literally thinking the color orange of a tree. And I'm like, dude, what? Like what, how? Anyways, so... Now, here's the thing, right? She may, she may grow big and, and produce shade, and that's nice. And, and she may grow big and produce a little home for a squirrel, and that's nice and all, right? But her primary purpose, the reason that, that Susie is here is to produce oranges. And if we want to give them more specific, right, like each branch exists to produce oranges. Yes, I love this. This is great, right? Each branch is, it exists to produce oranges. But now let's say, let's say this one right here. We'll call her Branchy, okay? Let's say Branchy is like, I, I, I'm kind of feeling apples. Like, I'm kinda, I'm, I think, I, think I'm, I should produce apples. And so, and so Branchy's like, let me, just, let me just break away here so that I can go and this is what happens when you, when it's, you don't think this through. Anybody got some scissors? Um, Right? Okay, come on. We got this. We got this. There we go. Branchy decides, I don't want to produce oranges. I'm, I'm feeling apples. And so, so she takes off to do her own thing. Y'all ready? What is Branchy going to produce? Death. Death. Nothing. Right? Like, it doesn't take a lot to realize this branch is no longer going to produce oranges, the purpose that it was created to produce. Now, her intentions may be great. She wants to produce apples to give to the world, right? She loves apples, and she feels it so deeply inside of her, and so she wants to chase after being an apple branch. But you and I know basic science, right? Branchy's not going to not only produce apples, she's also not going to produce... Oranges, the very reason she was created. The purpose of her existence. You were created on purpose for a purpose. Amen. Yes! You were created on purpose for a purpose. And one of the most asked questions in humanity, why am I here? What's my purpose? Right, college students, you're sitting there and you're like, man, what am I supposed to do with my life, right? Like, like, and we're thinking, what is my, what is my purpose for being? What, why, am I, why am I here? And the fullness of life that we believe every person is created to desire, that you do desire, you want to live life to the fullest, is found when we live according to our purpose, according to our original design. When we get in our heads, man, I'm going to go break away and do my own thing, not only will we not grab hold of that which we're chasing, we will also forsake our original purpose. That's where exhaustion and frustration and confusion and anxiety and all of those things that we live in all the time, that's where those exist. It's when we step outside of our original design and purpose. You're tracking with me? So my question becomes, what is our purpose and how do we live it out? If you and I were created on purpose for a purpose and the fullness of life is found when we live within that purpose, first obvious question, 
what the heck is that purpose, right? What is my reason for being here? And that's what we're going to spend the bulk of today talking about. It's laying that foundation. We're, we'll also spend a little bit then talking about how we live that out, but that's what the rest of the series is for. Because we genuinely desire for you to live in the fullness of life. And we believe that God gives us the way for that, which is in Jesus. Amen. And so, spoiler alert, that's what this will all come down to. But, but I don't want you to just hear this and be like, I've heard this before. I want you to realize that when we break away from our intended design and purpose, we will not grab hold of that which we think we're chasing, nor will we grab hold of our, inten our intended purpose and design in life. It, there's a way that seems right to man or a branch, and in the end, it leads to death. That's what Proverbs tells us. So what is our purpose, and how do we live in that? Now, I want to just go ahead and get this out of the way. When, I, when I'm asking the question, what is my purpose, I'm not, I'm not talking about, like, should I marry this person or that person? Should I be a teacher or a vet or in the Peace Corps? Now, should I live in Austin forever, or should I, you know, move to Toronto? Or l let me just go ahead and tell you, 9.8 times out of 10, you're not going to find that in here, by the way. This is 9.8 times out of 10, God does not have a specific purpose for you. He's got a general purpose, and then he tells you, hey, go and obey and live in that purpose however you want, however you're, you're created, however you desire. Look, there, there most likely not is one man you're supposed to marry or one woman you're supposed to marry. If that were the case, I guarantee you that got messed up a long time ago and it's all thrown off now. But God's like, oh, hey, you wanna be married? Great, be married to someone that you fit with and honor me in that. Obey me in that marriage. Oh, you wanna have a job? Great, teacher, perfect. Go be a teacher and honor me as a teacher. Oh, you don't wanna do that anymore? Go be a nurse and honor me as a nurse. Oh, you wanna live in Charlotte? Great, live in Charlotte and honor me in Charlotte. Most often, God has a general purpose, and he gives us the freedom to specifically live that how we desire, so long as it fits within that purpose. Does that make sense? This is great. I'm loving the interaction we have going here. So then let's, let's go ahead and nail down what is that general purpose, that purpose that God has for every one of us. What is that purpose? St. Augustine said, you have created us for yourself, O oh God, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. If you like to like, hear quotes from brilliant people who have gone ahead of us, this is one I'd encourage you to get to know. Because he hits on that purpose. You have created us for yourself, O oh God, and therefore our hearts will be restless until we rest in you. Turn to Genesis chapter one. Very first page of the, the Bible, once you get past the table of contents, um, the, the, the features, explanation of features, all those pages that we just skimmed past. Table of contents is great, y'all. If you're like, I don't know where this book is, like, let's turn to Obadiah. I didn't know that was a book in the Bible, right? Like, okay, table of contents, don't be ashamed of that. Turn to that bad boy. F find Obadiah, it's okay. Genesis, though, chapter one, the very beginning. If we're going to discover our purpose, then we should go back to the beginning, and we should certainly go back to the beginning before sin was mixed into this chaos, okay? So Genesis chapter 1 is where we're going to start. And in verse 1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So if we're going to understand our purpose, then we have to understand who the designer, the creator is of humanity, uh, of our, our purpose. I used to do this with my, my students. It's a, great, it's a great illustration. I'd pass out all this foil, like pieces of foil, and be like, hey, make it into whatever image you want, right? And so people would just be sitting there and they'd be taking the foil and stuff. And then I'd grab one that was kind of like abstract and you're like, okay, you didn't pass art class. But um, you know, I'd grab one of those and I'd pull it up and I'd be like, all right, let's have your interpretations. What is this, right? And people would shout out their interpretations. And then I would ask the designer, what did you create? and they would give the answer. The point being, only the designer actually has the right to say what something is. 
You want to have naming rights? Go create something. Right? If you want to be able to say, this is what it is, go, go design something and create it because only the architect, the designer, the creator gets to speak into and say, no, no, this is this. Only an artist gets to say, no, the painting actually means this. It may hit you a different way, but the meaning is this. So we have to know who is the creator of us so that we can then hear from that creator our purpose. We still, we still together? Sweet. Genesis 1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Deuteronomy 6, 4 says that the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. So we know that God is, oh, I did this last time. No, I got this, Charlie. I got this. Nope, that's not going to work either because it, it just, <laughs> oh, man. See, this is life. This is life and it's good and it doesn't have to be all polished and it's still good. So Deuteronomy 4, the Bible teaches that the God of Genesis 1, the creator of this world, is one God. There's one God. One God. But if we keep reading Genesis through this creation, then we get to chapter to verse 26, it changes a little bit. And, and, and where before it said, God said, let there be water, let there be earth. Now you get to verse 26 and it says, God said, let us make man in our image. Right, that, that's, a, that's a change from, and God, the singular pronoun said to now a plural, let us make man in our image. So as we're reading that, we gotta go like, okay, well who in the world is God talking to here? Like this is the beginning of time. Who's God having a conversation with? And what the Bible teaches us about this one God is that he exists in three unique but equal persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The three perfectly united as one. This is why God is called a triune God. Three united as one. The Trinity, you may hear, or the, the Godhead. So we want to be sure to like, say words, but also say what they mean. So when we say the Trinity, we're talking about the one God that is united as three persons. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. In Matthew 28, we have the Great Commission that we, each of us, are called to go and make disciples and then when we lead someone to faith in Jesus, we are to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The singular name, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, because the three together are God. So this is unique, right? This is what makes God different, and this is huge to our understanding of our, our purpose in life. But now we got to ask a question, okay, what is, what is this relationship like? Like, who is this God, this Father, Son, Spirit? How, how, does, how does God work within himself? Now, there's many characteristics we could say. God is holy. God is just. God is righteous. God is pure. Right? God is jealous. Like, you can say all of these characteristics, but I think the one thing that, that sums up who God is, that, that everything else flows out of, and that also gives definition to how Father, Son, and Holy Spirit interact with together is the single word, love. Love, God is love. In 1 John, John says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. God is love. Now, the, the Greek word that we have here for, for love is agape. The, the Greeks used three different, sometimes four, three different words primarily to communicate the word love. We use love for everything, right? Right? Like, I, I, I love my sneakers, and I also love Molly. Surely those loves are different, you know? Like, so, like, we use the word love for everything. Well, the Greeks, they, they use three different words, and the word agape in 1 John 4, where it says God is love, it says God is agape. Agape is an, a, an outward movement towards another's best. 
Agape, it's an, it's an outward movement towards another's best, towards their greatest good. Agape love is never inward. It is never selfish. It is never conceited. Right? It is, it is always moving outward towards another's best, towards another's good. It's generously giving itself away. And so if the one God who is Father, Son, Spirit is love, then the Father is love and the Son is love and the Holy Spirit is love. And so for all of eternity, you've got God the Father agapeing God the Son, generously giving love to God the Son. You've also got God the Father agapeing God the Holy Spirit. So the Father's love, but so is the Son. So you've got the Son giving love to the Father. You've got the Son giving love to the Holy Spirit. I bet you know where we're going here. You've got the Holy Spirit for all of eternity giving love to the Father, giving love to the Son. God, Father, Son, Spirit is love and for all of eternity has existed in this perfect divine communion of love. This perfection of always giving what's best for another, and also receiving that love from another. This is, this is how God interacts with himself. God didn't need our love. He didn't create the world because he, he was lacking in love. Right? God's love tank is full. Like, it's overflowing. It never runs short. So God wasn't in the beginning like, man, I... I'm really kind of needing some love. Let us make man in our image so that we can get more love. Right? No, no, God was good. So then why does God go and create this world with Adam and Eve and eventually us? Because the generous love of God simply desires to create a world that can join him in this communion. He's so generous, he's so overflowing in love that he wants to create a world and humanity within it that can join him in this divine communion of love. Not because God needs anything, he simply wants to, the best thing he can give is this, right? It's the best thing God can give to anybody and so he gives of himself to the world. So let's keep going. What is our purpose for existing today then? So this is who God is. This is how he has operated for all of eternity. This is what his original design was, was to create a world that would join him in this divine communion. And so he says in verse 26, now remember, this is where we start to hear our purpose. And remember, when we break away from our original purpose, it goes bad. God said, let us make man in our image. That's a purpose statement. It gives reason to why God is creating. Let us make man in our image. He didn't say that about the animals. He didn't say that about plants. He didn't say that about the water or the moon or the stars. It wasn't until God bent down and crafted a human being where he said, let us make man in our image. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on earth. So when I read the very beginning of God's creation, when he creates mankind, before sin enters the world, and I ask, what is God's purpose for Adam and Eve and every descendant after What is God's general purpose for your life? If if you've asked the question, why am I here? What is my purpose? Here is your general purpose. Here is why you exist on this planet. The reason you are here. Are you ready? 
One, to be like God. And two, to live like God to those around you. B, and the order matters, and then do. B, in the image of God, and then demonstrate the image of God to the world around you. The first thing I see is that God, when, when he desired to create humanity, not because he needed to, but because he wanted to, he created humanity and he said, let them be in our image. Let them join us in this divine communion. Let them exist among us. Our primary purpose, the primary reason you exist on this planet is to be in a loving relationship with the God of this world. This God who is love, and that's how he exists anyway, says, let me make a humanity that can join us in that, that can be in our image of of love. And yes, that's going to then call us to be holy as he is holy, and to walk in righteousness, and to put away sin, and to serve, like it's going to call us to do, but first, God's desire for you and for me is to be in a loving relationship with God him that is what makes us in his image that is why jesus when asked hey jesus what's the most important thing to do he answers love the lord your god with all your heart soul mind and strength so if you hear nothing else today the tip top of your purpose and your reason for being in this room on this planet is to be in a loving relationship with the god of this world Nothing will operate in your life as it is intended to operate outside of that loving relationship. This is where I hope things shift from the familiarity. Because I'm not just talking to a general people, I'm talking to you. You are here in this room because God wanted you to hear that nothing in your life will operate as he intended to operate outside of first being in a loving relationship with him. Nothing. The fullness of life is found in his image But then the second thing that God tells us our purpose is is to live towards others as he lives towards us, right? To have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock, to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish and the birds of the heavens, right? God's design was that he would put Adam and Eve in here and they would be in a loving relationship with him and that they would demonstrate his love to the world around them and then they would have babies and they would do the same thing and the whole world would be full of people that would be in a loving relationship with God and then would demonstrate that love to the world around them that is his intended purpose for you and for me to be in a loving relationship with him and then to demonstrate that love in the way that we rule and love and lead and serve and care for and fill the world with people who also then follow after God and repeat the process. So that's why Jesus says the most important commandment is to, what is it? Love God. What's the second? Love others. Jesus tells us our purpose on this planet that comes from Genesis chapter one is to love God, be connected with him, and then to take this love that we have from him and in his image, give it to others. Give it to the, give it to the creation, the world that he made for us. To tell the truth of God with our lives. So now I'll say again, Nothing will go in our lives as it's intended to go when we step outside of God's design for us to be in a loving relationship with him and then to give that love to the world around us. That is your reason for existing. That's why we're here. 
That's why Jesus says, you do those two things, everything, everything else will fall in place. That doesn't mean you're going to get everything you want. It just means that everything that God's called us to will fall into place when we do those two things right because that is our purpose in life. Be in relationship with God and then demonstrate that love to the world around us. I pray and I hope that that's sinking in because I know as well for you as for me it's a man, anxiety and frustration and worry and exhaustion feel like you're just spinning your wheels all the time, 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 and you're not going anywhere. But here's the deal. If I am being in a loving relationship with God and demonstrating that love to others, the results don't matter. I'm living in my purpose, and God promises that that is for my best, and good will come. But when I step outside of those purposes, when I... I'm created to be an orange tree, but I just want to be an apple tree. I'm stepping outside of God's design for our lives. And the lights have to come on that that his way and his purpose is, is better. It is good. Otherwise, we'll continue to try this. And it's going to end poorly. So so maybe that's all God wanted for you today was just to know that that's your purpose in life, to be in a loving relationship with him and then to give that love to the world around you. But the question my brain then says is, okay, how do I do that? Anyone else ask that next question? Great, now what? How do we do that? And so I just wanna kind of land the plane here today for a bit and then we're gonna spend the rest of the series talking about this in detail, but I, I wanna invite you to turn to John 15 as we answer that question at a, at a big level, how do, how do, how do you now, if you, you cognitively know, like you cognitively know, whether you believe it or not, that your purpose is to be in a loving relationship with God and to give love to the world around you. God says that's enough, right? That's your purpose. So how do we live in that from here? John 15 Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Jesus oftentimes used um, illustrations and analogies to communicate like real life application to people and he would frequently use, you know, tree talk, Right? And so he's like, hey, just how every branch of a tree is designed to produce fruit, to to bear, to produce a product with its life, so are you. You're designed to produce spiritual fruit. The fruit that you and I are designed to produce is a loving relationship with God that then moves into a demonstration of that love to the world around us. That is the fruit that our lives are meant to, to have. And so he says in verse four, how do we do that? Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit for apart from me, you can do nothing. How do we live in the purpose that God created us to live in? We abide in Jesus. The word abide, it's it's the verb verb form of abode, right? We, We make our home in Jesus. We connect with him. We are one with him. We remain in constant communion and fellowship and nearness to Jesus. How do we produce fruit in our lives? We abide in Jesus. How do we not produce the fruit in our lives? We don't abide in Jesus. We break away from Jesus, or or at most, maybe we're, we're dangling or something, right? But the answer to how we do this is that we abide in Jesus, we connect to him, we are near to him. We're not we're not just near the tree, right? Like that's man, over here, not gonna produce anything. What about here? Nope. 
No. What if it's just like hanging on like that? Is it going to produce fruit? No, probably not. Right? Jesus, very clear. This is not one where you have to go, man, Jesus, what did you mean? I think he meant that apart from abiding in him, you and I can do nothing. Like spiritually of our purpose, we cannot do it unless we abide in Jesus. He didn't really mince words here. Very black and white. So the question that comes down to us here is, will we believe the words of Jesus or not? Because if we truly believe them, we will do it. We do what we want. 24 hours of the day, you are doing what you ultimately want to do. And so if we believe Jesus to be telling the truth here, then we will figure out how to abide in him. Like we'll move everything to make that happen. If, if my child needs food to live, I'm going to figure out how to get my child food, right? It's black and white. And so Jesus gives us a very black and white statement here. If we want to produce the fruit that he's created us to produce, we have to abide in Jesus. We have to be connected to him. We have to remain in him. Next week, we'll talk about faith. Faith is how we abide in Jesus. But I don't know if we're going to get here next week. Who knows? So I want to I be sure to at least explain why the focus is on abiding in Jesus. Why abide in Jesus? This is what God created us for. But the Bible says that every one of us has, has gone our own way. We are created to be connected to God 24-7, to walk with him, to hear him, to know him, just like Adam and Eve did in Genesis 1 and 2. But every one of us has followed their steps of Genesis 3, and we have gone our own way, and we have broken this relationship with God. We fractured it. We we. We separated ourselves from his presence. But God in his kindness, in in ridiculous love, pursued us to, to fix what we broke, to repair this connection between us and God. And the way that God fixes what we broke is completely through Jesus. Jesus comes to earth to live among us, but not just to live among us, but to live as one of us and to live the life perfectly that you and I were supposed to live. To be in God's presence requires perfection, holiness, righteousness. None of us have lived up to that standard, and so Jesus came to live up to that standard for us. But then... Jesus dies on the cross. Why? Why does Jesus die? Well, because somehow our sin, our guilt, has to be paid for. If I get a speeding ticket and I just decide not to pay it, well, eventually I'm going to be arrested, and that's how I'm paying for it. Somehow, some way, though, the, the guilt has to be accounted for. Well, the, the guilt, what we earn for our sin is, is death, is separation from God. So Jesus in love came to suffer that punishment for us. So that it says, oh, that that record, that debt, it's paid in full. It no longer exists. That's why Jesus died, is to remove our record of debt. But what good is a dead savior? None. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, if Jesus hasn't risen from the dead, we're the most to be pitied. But Jesus rose from the dead and returned to heaven and recreated that connection possibility for us. This brokenness is now restored through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And then what we're gonna talk about in full next week, Jesus invites us, hey, if you will trust me, like not, not be near me, not think, man, that looks great over there. I like this Jesus guy. But like, if you will trust me and surrender to me, the power of his spirit is that he can supernaturally rejoin us into the branch that is God. We can be united again to our original 
purpose in life. And it's by trusting in Jesus and then the more that we follow him and do what he tells us to do, we become like him and we know the fullness of life that he created us to have. So where are you? I feel like that's what God's wanting me to ask you right now. So really, that's what God's asking you. Where where are you? Do do you believe this? Do do you trust this? And if you're like, man, I I really don't. Don't force it. Don't fake it. It's okay. Let's be real here. God meets us where we are. He's okay with that. Where where are you? Do, Do you trust that this is who God is, that he created us to be in a loving relationship with him and to give that love to others? Do you believe that purpose for your life? Have you trusted in Jesus to reconnect us back into relationship with the Father, with God? Are you following him in obedience? And we'll talk about that near the end of the series, right? We have to follow him in obedience. As soon as we don't follow him in obedience, we're now separating ourselves again. We're putting obstacles in between our communion with God. But know that God desires the fullness for you, abundance. He desires more than we can think or imagine. And that by faith in him, we enter into that purpose of a loving relationship with God. And then we're called to give that love to the world around us.